coming up on Talk About It, the hackers who go mainstream. I would consider myself, if you want to use that definition, a white hat hacker because I don't break the law. The renaissance of the art of taxidermy. I just did a wish for a boy from the Starlight Foundation. He was 14 years old and his wish was to do um, taxidermy. They could have made Kanye or something, you know. <laughs> and the woman giving young Fijians a voice. When you're not asked your opinion, you start feeling like, I don't matter. So we need to show that we value every type of leadership that women bring. Hi, I'm Delarani. Have you ever been hacked? Most of us are now virtually constantly linked to technology of some kind, whether it's your smartphone, your tablet or your computer. While it means we're much more connected, it also means we're much more vulnerable. And more and more hacks are making the headlines. Some of the stories are pretty frightening. Kill the engine. So we're killing the engine right now. Okay, hold on tight. Hold on. While others are more of a case of schadenfreude. Millions of users of the website Ashley Madison, including Australians, have every reason to be nervous. Life is short. Have an affair. I'm looking for someone other than my wife. The dating site has been hacked. Even governments are targets, with top secret information made public. Relations between China and the United States are under more strain after a massive cyber security breach. Hackers managed to access the records of all American federal government employees dating back three decades. While these cases made global headlines, experts say that here in Australia, security breaches are happening every single day. So, are you worried about being hacked? <laughs> I'm not really worried about getting hacked. I mean, I put all my information on the internet anyways. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I have all my credit card details and all. I've never been hacked. I suppose I'm a little bit worried. I'm always suspicious when I log on. My friend, um, she tapped and go at a petrol station and her information was taken from there. You don't want anyone you know, getting hold of your personal information and then sort of frauds is coming to it. Australia is quite secure in this kind of section, not like in China. On a larger scale, I think it's a problem, but I'm not too worried about it personally. I don't think young people tend to worry about it so much. I think if you're going to use the internet, there's going to be that risk. But some companies are actually asking to be hacked and they're paying people to do it. Sound strange? Well, it's all about testing for security flaws and finding the bugs before the bad guys or the so-called black hat hackers do. Even companies like Google are paying cash bug bounties to these white hat hackers. But who are they? I guess just like, just like people, you know, um, hackers come in all, all shapes and sizes. I would consider myself, if you want to use that definition, a white hat hacker because I don't break the law. My name is Nathaniel Wakeland. I just turned 20. I work as an application security consultant for a, um, a fairly large cyber security firm based out of um, the United States. I'll assess an organization's uh, applications. I'll look at what those applications are running, what they do, and I'll look at how to break that existing functionality. Uh, an example of that would be uh, creating a link where when you, you would get a link in your email and you click it and it would transfer money out of your bank account or um, vulnerabilities where I can reset your password instead of my password, things like that. I work for companies that span every sector. For the bug bounties, it's um, all the big names, Twitter, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, PayPal. You can definitely reduce, reduce the amount of vulnerabilities in an environment but they're always going to be there. We're more moving towards people that commit crime and people that don't commit crime. I would venture that a lot of people that are white hats have a little bit of black hat in them, and a lot of people that are black hats who are breaking the law do do the, the right thing sometimes. Most people that are going to break the law are going to break the law anyway. It's not, it's not something that you know you don't wake up one day once you've gotten a skill set and say, oh shit, let's start committing criminal acts now. IT security is, is a great place to be, but you can't, 
just start doing this because you want to make money. That's not how it works. It's very much got to be something you're passionate about. You can't go to, to university and learn the fundamentals of, break, of breaking the computer systems. You've got to already know those fundamentals and then pursue things in, in your own time. I, I don't think that the university can teach you to do that. You have to learn, you don't learn the hack. While it may be the case for some that you don't learn to hack in the more traditional sense, these days some universities are prioritising cyber security and coming up with new ways to teach it. They say big companies, including banks and even the Defence Department, can't get enough of their graduates. In fact, it's estimated there's currently around 1 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs right around the world. Welcome to everyone to week two. Who's new this week? I know we've got some new students. University of New South Wales' Richard Buckland has been bucking the trend for a while now. The universities everywhere are basically teaching defence um, in, in the absence of thinking about the attackers. But he's been doing things differently supervising Australia's first technical security course for several years. For example, with a house, you could spend a lot of money on your front door and you could think you bought the best front door and you could be so proud of the front door and think it's fantastic, but you might not notice you've, you've left the back door open. It's a bit blurred, or is that my eyes? How does it look to you guys? People come to me and say, can I have the names of your top five students? And I say, you can't even have the names of my bottom five students. They've all got jobs. So the demand for professionals, cybersecurity professionals, is growing. And I can't see it slowing down or turning around. It's been growing so much that Luke Anderson has been watching on keenly. I've been on the computer since I was about three years old. I've been pulling it from apart and building it since I was about 11 or 12. After working in security for the startup company Freelancer.com, Luke is now lecturing at the University of Sydney and he's about to shake things up. I was originally teaching a course in first semester that focuses on kind of higher level security concepts like uh, encryption algorithms and how you use them and, and the basics of security. Um, and it's a very full course, a lot of content, very interesting, but it doesn't actually teach uh, students how computers uh, get hacked into. I went to the university and I said, Look, this, this is a great course, it's really important, but it's not teaching students what they need um, to actually enter industry. So we're going to be looking at, A, how does a hacker actually break into computer systems? What avenues do they use? What sort of information do they look at? Um, and, and how you can protect that sort of sensitive information. Uh, then we're going to be looking at how to detect those, those intrusions and how to stop them. But both lecturers say they're not in the business of equipping students with skills to be used for illegal purposes. Ethics is a very important part of our course and we talk about you know, how people end up in jail, why you don't need to be a black hat and why you're actually a bad, bad person if you do this, why it is a real crime. If people want to learn to do bad things, the internet's out there to teach you how to do bad things. Our job is to teach people how to do good things. If we don't teach it, we'll just produce more hackers. Parts of the world, this time of year is known as cutting season. A time when some families send their daughters to undergo female circumcision. It's not always an easy topic to talk about, but it's something US President Barack Obama brought up on his recent trip to Kenya. There's no reason that young girls should suffer genital mutilation. These traditions may date back centuries, they have no place in the 21st century. Those who practice it say they do so for a number of reasons, ranging from hygiene and initiation rights to religion and community pressure. And although the UN officially banned female genital mutilation, also known as FGM, in 2012, it's estimated that up to 140 million women who are alive today have been genitally mutilated or cut. So what's being done to stop it? The hashtag EndFGM is the online part of a campaign to try to make sure female genital mutilation soon only exists in our history books. In the UK, activists are using music to get the message across. It's time for equality, so make it our mission. To stop girl mutilating, grooming, not violating. This is our future, and yes, we're living in it. Join our revolution and see the bigger image. Here in Australia, 
The issue may not often make the headlines, but the message is just as important. It needs to be ongoing mm. to actually, you know, figure out how far it's um, reaching communities. Yeah. Melbourne's Multicultural Centre for Women's Health has been working with women who've experienced FGM. It's hard to say just how prevalent the practice is because many of the women who've experienced it may have gone through the process long before they moved here. My mom came home one day and said we were going to visit a friend. We ended up in a bush and in that bush we met an old lady who my mom had a chat with and before I knew it my mom was pinning me down. Different cultural groups carry out different versions of the practice, some more extreme than others. Some have more of an impact on women's health and the others have less of an impact on uh, women's sexual and reproductive health, but they do also, many women have reported that it has an impact on their mental health, so no less um, significant for the woman herself. It's important to say that it's not an African practice, that not all communities in the whole African continent um, practice it, but that in the communities that are in Australia, the larger numbers are from um, African countries. There was some recent research, and both of those research projects found that there's uh, a diminishing um, support for the practice in most of the communities. But there is concern that some communities are being ignored because of the focus on the African community. The Southeast Asian um, area, the, there's been a few communities in there that practices FGMC that may have, you know, been, I guess, lost through, um, you know, the focus has always been Afrocentric. Um, so right now we're trying to develop resources that covers um, other parts of um, Asia and even some places in South America as well that practices FGMC. Zubaida is from Singapore and as a young girl hearing about her friends being circumcised was relatively normal. You don't really even talk about it if um, if a community member was um, you know doing it to their daughter um, to a newborn baby then you know you would go to their house for a little, you know, a little party, a little feast. Um, that's just what, what's normally done. But she started questioning just how normal it was when she moved to Australia. My thinking, I guess, got changed. It's a practice that, you know, shouldn't be done anymore. It's very old and very ancient. To help change other people's attitudes, Zubaida now produces educational materials explaining just that and tailors programs specifically for different communities. The topic of FGMC is quite sensitive um, for a lot of communities who you know, don't wish to speak about it openly. So um, we have to take that into, concern, uh, into consideration when we're actually developing the resources. The working week began with the hashtag calm yourself in four words proving popular with social media users summing up what helps them to stay relaxed, happy and beat the Monday blues. Activists in Malaysia are hitting social media to get support for mass street protests amid ongoing political unrest. The electoral reform group Basir says government corruption has hurt the country's economy. Hundreds have left angry comments on the Prime Minister's Facebook page, while supporters are getting behind the planned rallies using the hashtag Berser4. Google's move to restructure under a new parent company called Alphabet may have caught much of the tech world by surprise, but it wasn't long before the online jokes began. And a video of an American news presenter storming off during a live broadcast has gone viral. I don't How care. care. I'm, I'm, family. I'm sick of this family. family. John Brown tweeted his surprise at the strong reaction it got on social media, with the large majority applauding him for refusing to discuss another Kardashian celebrity story. Taxidermy is something many of us may associate with dusty, historical museum displays of long extinct animals. But it seems that it's making a bit of a return. So, have you ever been tempted to preserve a beloved pet? 
or are the dead not for decorating? I love my cat, but no, I don't want her forever. <laughs> well, I've got pets, but um, yeah, I don't. I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I would if I had some pets. Not much difference to someone's ashes in an urn, I guess, right? People do that for a hobby. <laughs> I think that's a bit strange. It just seems a little bit creepy. I think it's a pretty valid hobby and art form, right? I mean, if you're going to kill an animal, you might as well enjoy the rest of it for as long as you can. I don't agree with it. I think it's really cruel to animals. Yeah, even though they're dead. I suppose if they've died of natural causes, that's cool. Well, you can't just go out and just you know, grab something because you want to put it on your shelf. It's a bit weird, I think. I feel like once they go, you should just let them go. So taxidermy isn't for everyone, but some young creative people say it's an art form. It's moving away from the big game trophy hunters, like the American dentist who recently killed the famous Zimbabwean lion Cecil and faced a social media storm as a result. So for the next generation of taxidermists, what's the fascination? So Natalie, you're a taxidermist and we're in your studio here in Melbourne where you run workshops for other people that might be interested in taxidermy. Yeah. How did you get started? What made you interested? Funnily enough, I have a, a corporate job as well and I didn't have uh, an artistic outlet at all. So tell me about your journey. Initially I stalked a mentor until he took me on, so I sent him a few hundred emails. Um, and uh, he finally agreed to take me on, so I started uh, going there every single weekend and learning this, this craft. I want to take a look around your studio. I understand you have a freezer full of dead animals. Yes. Can we have a look? Yes, we can have a look. Okay. It was a defining moment in my journey as a taxidermist to get my own freezer and to stop utilising the kitchen fridge. I was really fortunate to um, be donated these little guys recently, a little, um, a woman heard me on uh, a rabies, uh, ABC radio interview and uh, she had actually had these beautiful painted finches die that morning and was quite distraught and uh, called me afterwards and reached out and thought that she'd like to donate them to me. So what happens next? First part would always be your skinning. Okay. Um, but there's a lot more involved in taxidermy than skinning. The skinning's the easy part. The putting it back together is the tricky part. Oh wow. Okay, looking forward to finding out more. Yeah. <laughs> Just come under here. Yep. And so this is your workbench. This is where you do most of the work you do? Yep. Yep. I've got a few little areas, but this is my new standing workbench. Before we, I guess, get into the process of it, there is a lot of stigma in this industry. What type of have you ever received negative feedback about your chosen industry? Uh, I wouldn't call it negative feedback, I'd just call it more so death threats. It's more so being people behind a computer screen. Recently in the news there was the story about the death of Cecil the Lion in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Has that at all made a difference in your industry? No, not with me. I think because my focus is very much education based. It's very much about um, you know, trying to showcase the beauty of this industry and making it a little bit more accessible for people. Um, but certainly it has been a very large debate and perhaps other taxidermists who more so work in the bi with big game and things like that may um, have come under attack. So can you talk me through the process? Uh, yeah, so initially what you would do with a piece um, after you've taken out of the freezer I let it thaw just a little bit before I start working on it um, and then you would proceed to skin your piece. For example, I'm working on a little bird at, a mo at the moment so I would take his little body that I have skinned and then we need to... So this is a skinned bird, is it? Yep, this is his little torso and his little neck. So you then need to recreate this anatomy. You can't have anything inside your piece um, that can deteriorate. And then the most common... Um, thing that uh, people put in taxidermy in Australia is uh, something called polyurethane. We would take this little bird body and we would draw that and then I would then hand carve that and replace that anatomy. And then for your skeletal structure, because you need to replace all of that, um, we would use wires and cotton wool. 
Tell me a bit about your students, because I understand you run classes and there's been a huge amount of demand. Mm -hmm. What do you think's behind that? So I think people have really wanted to engage in this art and just didn't have any access to it. It's just been, I think, interesting for me, the demographic that's shown up. It's been uh, mainly females, 90% are females. So Terry and Liz, what made the both of you interested in taxidermy? Um, I first got into it, well, thinking that it was something creative that I could do, uh, given that I don't have an ounce of artistic ability. Was it the same for you, Liz? Um, I was looking for um, a hobby, I suppose, or something to take up that was um, something crafty. I've been uh, looking for something to do and it sort of just ticked all the boxes for me. So in the class you both learned how to stuff a mouse, but would either of you ever actually stuff an animal that you were close to? A pet, for example? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm actually looking forward, sort of, when my pet dies, my dog. Yeah, I'd like to get her stuffed. She'd look amazing. <laughs> Here in Australia, there's been a lot of discussion about how to get more young women into politics. We need to make it a lot easier for younger, career-minded women to choose public life, to choose politics. We've tried the old women just breaking through the glass ceiling by some miracle. We've tried that for generations in the Liberal Party. Now we've got to join most of the developed world and increasingly countries like Rwanda and the Pacific Island nations. While Charmin Stone is right, some of our neighbours in the Pacific do have quotas for women in Parliament, the majority of people across the Pacific say that despite this, there's still a long way to go in terms of women's rights. Hi, my name is Rita Bill. I'm from uh, Vanuatu. My name is Gary Hatigewa. I'm from Solomon Islands. I'm Johnny Koguter from Timor-Leste. My name is Mark Kayok and I'm from Papua New Guinea. I can tell that women and children are the mostly affected um, by the cyclone palm. They're most uh, vulnerable. One of the main issues of concern right now in Papua New Guinea is uh, to do with uh, uh, domestic violence. In rural areas, it's, it's very hard to uh, to get views of people who, uh, who have become victims of domestic violence. We need to improve to give a way to uh, women to participate in economy and development. It's about time where men also support um, women issues um, and advocate more. Fiji is another specific country where women struggle to have their voices heard. It's a patriarchal society, which means females are often marginalised when it comes to decision making. But one woman, armed with a radio station that fits into a suitcase, is trying to change that. I'm Sharon Bhagwan Rolls. I'm a Fiji Islander. Born here, great granddaughter of indentured labourers who came from India. Um, product of some mixed blood as well as along the way. I'm also a mother and I am very passionate about the work I do at FemLink Pacific which gives me an opportunity to work in media which is my chosen profession but also for the advocacy of women's rights. I found a connection between being able to practice my media profession and the connection with my sense of feminism and that it wasn't just about my story but that when we talk about feminism, equality, human rights, it's that connection we can make as a community of women. Fiji is a patriarchal society and if you look at all our governance structures, um, traditional, local, even parliamentary, at the political level, we haven't seen any change in addressing the gaps in decision making. I often say that one of the reasons women aren't featured enough in the news is we're not equal when it comes to leadership. Whether it's in the government systems as permanent secretaries or high level decision makers of government or within the parliament or in the governance structures where one would be quoted. So that's where we're not making the news. So this is FemLink Pacific's suitcase radio kit. And so it literally is in the suitcase. So you have the main console. You've got a gooseneck mic. 
It comes with two CD players and two um, portable tape recorders. So the operating panel is really important for us because we have been working with women with disabilities. It's also been important to have the technology that's appropriate. On Fem Talk 89 FM, coming to you live from Nandi, where we just completed Amplifying Pacific Voices. What happens over time, as we found, is that when you're not asked your opinion, you start feeling like, I don't matter. You start undervaluing yourself. So we need to show that we value every type of leadership that women bring. The first time I did a radio broadcast with some senior citizens in a small town called Bar. We were packing up the suitcase kit and there were two women sitting there. They would be in their 70s. And they spoke to me in Hindi saying, you know, all our lives we've listened to radio coming out of Suba. But you, one, you've brought radio to us. Two, we've heard our voice because we pre-produced the programs. And three, we had a chance to sing on the radio. So that was, I, I cried afterwards. I'd never cried after doing any of my television or radio work, you know, in the years prior to this. And that was, to me, that's the impact that I carry. And that's it for Talk About It this week. Remember, though, you can join in the conversation on Twitter by tagging me and using the hashtag TalkAboutIt or find us on Facebook. From the team here, thanks for your company. I'm Della Rani. I'll see you next time.